Of art is to temple, and to escape is to survive. Among the many stone Buddhas, a novice from Luan Prabang, barely half my naive years, beneath Bo's loose robes, caught seconds before the next orange prayer, walking towards Nirvana, his smile precocious. I wondered if someday, in a distant century, we would see a statue of him paving the way for my children. A discussion of monsters. In America, monsters arrive through Ellis Island or from the stars or morning's rogue angels. In Asia, the ghosts hop, hair long, eyes black, and girls from Taiwan will squeal in terror at that lonely world, but laugh with disdain at Hollywood soulless piles of pixels and latex signifying obsolete demons. and archaeology of snow forts. There's not much left to be said some well-washed stone hasn't heard before. History is composed of broken walls and bad neighbors. Just ask these chips from Berlin, the Parthenon and Cafe, or these cool magma hands of Pompeii, dark and gray. If you listen carefully in the right place on University Avenue, you will learn there's a minor wall near the Yalu River dancing on the hills of Chin for the moon. Who knows exactly what I mean? in every ton worth mention. She's moonlighting as a curved garden serpent, coiling around old Leokoan, the suspicious one with an astute eye, crooning with a sly wink. Come, touch true history. And how the moon must laugh when she spars the tiniest hill in Minotanka, where the small hands of the earth have created a magnificent white wall, a snowy miniature Maginot, raised some scant hours before, already melting into a hungry, roiling river, was not yet finished eating Louisiana for brunch. Babylon Gallery. She brought the gray spoon we hung upon the gallery wall from the talat stalls in downtown Ponsavon. She was supposed to be collecting da neng, folk tales, and we were showing off the art we were so certain would change the way the world sees that stumbled elephant we rode in on. She was an indelicate work, this one. A light cockatrice feather, crude malice her center, her bowl an echo of bomb craters whispering mad as Gorgon. They dine of spoons like this all over here, we're informed. Hammered from war scraps the dogs find indigestible. They sold me this one, certain it's American bullets at the core. It was time, they said, we took them back. I pondered how many startled people this carnivorous spoon passed through in previous incarnations, karma denying her a role in a finer flatware set for the saints. Oddly, for as many threads as she cut short, she was too weak to be the butter knife she should have been. Swords into plowshares, someone scribbled casually in the comment card. One of many remarks, disposable as plastic sporks. Burning Eden, one branch at a time. My father, a skull before the wars were over, never saw my mother's flight in terror as our humbled kingdom fell to flame and shell. My mother was stripped to income under bureaucrats, a number for the raw statistics of jungle errors collated into cold ledgers marked classified. My feet, dangling in the Mississippi, have forgotten what the mud in Vinchan feels like between your toes while my hands hold foreign leaves and I whisper, maple, oak, weeping willow, as if saying their names aloud will rebuild my home. Cameos. People would be surprised how often you truly show up in these poems of mine, among various fantasies of lost civilizations and tongues, or words for beauty and justice for a wondrous era yet to come. On worlds, vast light years from Gutrin Draconis or Orion, where perhaps Lao outdid everyone by surprise after all, despite that shaky start since Yin Bin Fu in a galaxy far away from an alternate timeline no one recalls. And you, you never recognize yourself in the tiny corner of these verses, or the moment we shared in a brief lifetime in that city we almost dared call home. Democracia. Father was a tiger, ground beneath the wheels, 
This fat was burned to light a torch, but there's no liberty here. Only the ashes of a village that couldn't evolve, where ghost grandchildren play with ghost grandparents, and the parents are nowhere to be seen at all. Where have they gone? Where have they gone? A delay of a day for an idea? A delay of a lifetime for the dead upon the ground? Look what remains. This hut hasn't the ambition of Ozymandias. These craters were once a rice field. This ox was no man's enemy. And what we have left to say could explode any minute. Diasporas like rivers. Winding through the course of our lives, memories like so many fish of war and loss, love and family. Time takes its toll, ruthless, unrelenting. The factory floor, the classroom so rarely requires an understanding of the distance between Saigon and Vinchan, Lan Chen or Din Bien Phu, let alone a high school horror story in 1970s Phnom Penh. Our ancestors would weep at half of what we've forgotten already. Our parents just want to eat one thing that reminds them of the old country. In the classrooms, the children hide their lunch from frying peers who've no appreciation for nut mom, badek, or purple sticky rice. The other day, a man came by who knew where we were from for once, tried to say, we're not so different between the Macon and the Mississippi, 10,000 lakes and as many stories. I want to be polite, accept that bridge, sturdy as for 35, but 45 years later, our stirred story can't be condensed into a made-for-TV miniseries, roots tangled, filtering, growing beneath a cold northern star, more than bamboos amid the pines, the oaks, whatever it takes to rebuild. I gather my fishing pole, a cassette recorder, my family for a weekend away from it all. Maybe the water will cleanse us, maybe the stories will return, sometimes a trickle, sometimes a flood. Pluribusunum. Ewer tells me a story over a hot hibachi, how she went to Laos to see her lucky sisters for the first time in two decades, since the country has loosened up enough to let tourists like us in. Isn't it beautiful, she asked me. Ben says she gave her sister Mary fifty dollars to help her family. When Ewer returned to the Twin Cities, she learned her sister had been murdered for the money by Mary's ex-husband, who'd heard of their family reunion and thought the cash rightfully belonged to him. Did you give your relatives anything, she asks. Yes, I reply, five hundred dollars, but they say they need more to get to America. Hmm. It's a monster. Aus das Kind kind war, war es die Zeit der folgenden Fragen. Warum bin ich, ich und warum nicht du? I began like Pooh, the uncarved block in a strange land. Simulacrum, wood golem knocking about, dreaming of flesh. Lies, truths, growths, recede and wonder what is to be. Du venons nous, que sommes nous, où allons nous? Where come we Where sind we Where in gain we Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? How long have I got? Father never answers. Why he is surprised when I bolt a prodigal arrow into a world I can only suspect among gears and puppets. Wonderful world. I saw a boy herd an ox. I saw a drog dropping bones in the water, barking for more. I saw a bathing woman with a beggar on a crutch of wood. I saw a wretch with a dead albatross and the archers whose arrows were beyond them. I may have seen a fleeting vanity fair, some carnival of souls. I saw a mon orphan calling nagakins from the riverbank, expecting nothing. More like Leviathan, peer of Melville's albino, abyssal gaze returned. Within your belly like a worm, after a lifetime of fighting, how I've become like you, adrift in the sea, Jonah, a leaf, 
while the boy next to me has become a jackass. And yet I still wish and yearn, Dionysian, a destiny, not a dynasty. Well, Bobby, you'll be pleased to know. The guillotine stopped falling on heads in France by the year I was born. After just one last fellow, whose name I cannot find, nor his crime. I admit, I have not looked very far into the matter. Curiosity is one thing, morbidity is another. Father, I saw you in the shadows of my mirrors, an elusive memory, known only through my mother, described as widow of, after she signed those papers releasing me for adoption by the Americans, a paper bird. And I know you by features mother and I do not share. Those jungles are distant assassins of my identity. I cannot lift the leaves of that last tree that held you and curse the poor arboreal nursing. It would change nothing. Accusations are futile. Your last words are lost, my father, and I would never have understood them anyway. I cannot put you to rest. I cannot pronounce your family name. You are just bones among bones that cannot get up. You are a smile, gleaming, white as wax melting, scattered and dust in the mountains of our ancestors. In your wake, I rise forth with a most delicate of freedoms. Five Fragments Only seven people walked away from S-21. My critics asked me to find the beautiful words to make this more than a statement, chase the rhythms and meter to propel this into true poetry. Aesthetics mustn't die in literature. Don't starve language with your emaciated lyric. Don't keep back the flourishes that will set these words apart, where anger and memories will become only passing wind, and the tattered spines of your work about this camp will be thrown into the garbage without even the pomp of a Berlin book burning. Surely the 14,000 would appreciate that, who have no eyes, no voice, no hands to applaud and cheer anymore. They want me to splash in Paul Potts rivers and to find the true tears when we have fallen rain. But if you ask my neighbors across the hall, you will find a particular indifference whether I succeed or not. When the portraits came in black and white, stained and torn out of place of artistic intent, they were mounted upon a plain white wall in the Weissman Museum, across from a stout statue of a squatting Buddha and his irresponsible smile. Recovered from the mud after the Khmer rogues went running, there were no names, only stench of numbers that meant nothing the next day in the camp. How many years have they been touring these haunted faces, hoping someone would recognize them long enough to restore names to them? If a words, it's tragic, cross your lips, the odds increase horrifically that you will give a matter no further thought within hours. In the other gallery, the on solemn cabinet of curiosities, custom assembled for the university, was amusing the spectators with all the charm of a Renaissance scholar. All the usual divisions were there, underworld, sea and air, the terrestrial realm, humankind, the library and archive, the allegory of vision, the allegory of sound and time, the allegory of history. Gaze upon the sodomites descent into hell, a specimen of algae, a large hand-painted fan, a freeze-dried cow lung, a set of black Chinese binding shoes, both in forceps from the late 1800s whose modern counterparts have barely changed, a Napoleonic teapot, in the words of Yul Brenner, etc, etc, etc. The day I went, a young woman in green muttered to her boyfriend, what is this junk from the basement? It's not art and it doesn't belong here. Moments later, he replied thoughtfully, I wish they validated parking. When the B-52s pummeled Nyak Lon by accident, over a hundred Khmer died without cause, for no more ceremony than a shrill whistle and a burst of flame and shrapnel from a mile high. Ambassador Swank, who came to assuage the grief of those who survived with the grand gesture of $100 bills, American, according to an anguished footnote from a man who had read about the matter in a London paper at the time. A woman I know from a village near Angkor Wat tries to escape the nightmares of the camps today by filling her house with tropical trees and flowers from her homeland she remembered as a little girl. In 1990, over an after-school match of Trivial Pursuit, my teacher asked, what is the name of a country where Pol Pot instituted Year Zero, killing thousands of his countrymen? 
Cambodia, I answered with certainty, confident and familiar. No, he replied. No, what the hell is it then? The card says Cambodia. It's the same thing. No, it's not. Ten years later, I can't believe I argued over that point as I stare at crude wooden tables piled with scarves near Phnom Penh. In two years, I don't believe I've said more than a dozen words to my, to my neighbors in the apartment below me. That's just the way it is. The other day, I walked past the grandmother trying to talk to her one counterpart across the hall. Broken English, hesitant and uncertain, become the bridge as each stood in their doorway, fumbling towards something resembling an ordinary conversation. Gardening and grandchildren seemed to be the subject. I still don't know what to make of it all. My head, heavy as a mango, without a mouth to feed. On John, I know. My young brother worries one day, after all it took to live here, his new nieces, who haven't even been born yet, won't understand a word of his poetry, or how to dance with an elephant, let alone a Kinley or a New York Apsara. Putting Huasai on the literary map after centuries is a precedent, but is it poetry? To tell someone from tomorrow, Sabaidi, how are you, from someone who cared enough to leave notes? Is that all a Lao poem can be in the shadow of Camp Pendleton? I show him a copy of CIA Dope Calypso. Why should a white howl be the very last word? I smile as he shows all he can do with a pen. They fling us at empires when a cosmos needs to die, engineered by the best AI minds of New Lancha. In the boot tubes we sing, they'll never let us in, they'll never let us in to holy him upon, not quite monkey, not quite man. In the future, true havoc needs more than a mere dog for war. Lautonium shell around a simian soul, dropping through the sky, ready to die, armed to the bone with three strong hearts, tailored for express mayhem and murder of your pristine social orders. We close our eyes with enough time to dream. Six hard minutes through the hot atmosphere, visions of fabled Dalvanon, our own planet, our own Caesar, our own books of law and liberty. Ape shall never kill ape, no spill blood, the joys of Ahimsa. A distant world keeping all of your promises made to us for 400 centuries. Golden Triangle, Holy Mountain. Why ever see poppies in their natural habitat? How red they appear in all of these pictures besides mountain women with their dark turbans, dour and thin, up to their waists in grass. Leftover bombs loiter at their cautious feet, who have no time for strangers pleading with them to say, cheese, gone with a flash of light before the harvest is done. Her body, my monuments. Feels as a thirsty knock in April, nestled in a dress the hue of sleepy tat dam on Chanta Kumen. Her lissom stride awakes dreamers, the colors of a world, the children of rivers, our sandalwood city where talats greet the moon, pee dance with dreams, and the future begins to stir, not with a yawn, but her laugh, a gaze that is known stars, the way others know flowers. In the beginning, depending on the tradition you hear, there was nothing, or there was chaos, no time, no space, not even a single atom, not a ray of light, a whisper, no scent of papaya or rivers, not a body, not a soul, not a ghost of a dok champa, or even a memory of a touch in the darkness, or a taste of a home-cooked meal from a tiny garden in the window of a dreaming woman, asleep amid her books and clothes, her brushes and tools. In the beginning, though, there was no hate, no war, no anger, no constant return to life after life because of our ignorance and lust. Still, I look back with no regrets at our world of fires and love, of ice and hope. My mouth opens in song in the brief time upon earth I have, creating amid destruction, growing against silence. <laughs>